Okay, we've now seen the broad reinforcement learning setting, the sequential decision making setting. Uh, but in the next few slides, we'll be formalizing this even further. Right? So we'll be talking about this idea of the Markov decision process. But before we get into that, let's actually kind of set up an example uh, of a very simple Markov decision process. And from that, we will generalize more broadly to what a general Markov decision process looks like. All right, so here is a very toy example of a Markov decision process. Um, and so in this case, um, we have this grid of cells. Uh, one of those cells happens to be occupied and the other cells are free. And the agent starts at this location and the agent has to navigate this grid of cells in some way. And it's going to receive at every time step a small negative reward. So for every so it's trying to accomplish some task. We don't know yet what that task is, but it's going to, for every time instant that is spent in the grid, it's going to lose some, um, some uh, reward. It's going to get a penalty. So a small negative reward corresponds to a small penalty. Its, ta its aim is to complete the task as quickly as possible, therefore. Right? So whatever task it is, it has to complete it as quickly as possible so that it doesn't accrue this negative reward over time. And there is also a big bonus for if the agent ends up at this state. And this state is also what's called a terminal state because once you reach the state, then you don't have any more turns. You have completed your episode and um, you don't need to do anything more in the environment. You can't do anything more in the environment. Similarly, if you end up at this state, this is also a terminal state. And again, in this case, you get a large reward, but this time you get a large negative reward. So you get a large penalty for ending up at this state. All right. So this is basically telling us what we need to accomplish. So both of these two together, uh, which define the, the rewards in this environment, are telling us that what we need to do is get as quickly as possible to this square while trying to avoid falling into this square. Okay. And the agent's action space is that it can move either forward or to the right or to the left or downwards. So north, east, south or west. And if it tries to move, let's say south from this square, then uh, it will stay where it is. If it tries to move west from the square, it'll stay where it is. If it tries to move into a solid cell, it'll stay where it is, right? So all of those forbidden actions result in a no op. So you don't really get to move your agent at all, which of course is a penalty because you are, you've wasted some time, right? Because you get a small negative reward for wasting time. And even if you execute a valid action, even if you try to execute a valid action, uh, where for example, from this state, you're trying to move forward, that action is only executed correctly 80% of the time. The remaining 20% of the time is split between two options. So for example, if you were at this state and you tried to move forward, then 10% of the time you will end up in this square instead and 10% of the time you'll end up in this square instead. And so that's kind of visually depicted here at the bottom. So this basically defines your entire um, Markov decision process for, for the simple grid world environment. And the goal of reinforcement learning is to try to maximize the sum of rewards. All right, so we're going to try to maximize the sum of rewards over time until you terminate the episode either at that square or at that square. So this is a simple example of a Markov decision process. Let's now try to generalize from it. All right, so before getting into the description of um, the Markov decision process, let's quickly look at a visualization of what we saw in the case of um, the grid world as the state transition, right? So um, if our grid world had been deterministic, then you could have drawn a state transition diagram in the following way. Uh, this is what we'll call a state transition diagram, where we map from one particular state to another state, right? And the thing that's mapping it is an action. So in particular, if you execute the north action from this state where the agent is occupied in this x square, then you will move one step forward and therefore you'll end up in this state of the environment, right? And you can similarly draw what the states corresponding to the other actions would have been. And 
in the stochastic version of the, the environment that we actually described on the previous slide, uh, you wouldn't really end up with a single state in the end. Instead, you would have a distribution over three states. Uh, in particular, you'd have a 10% uh, distribution, a 10% probability of ending up in this state, an 80% probability of ending up in this state, and a 10% probability of ending up in this state. So this is useful to remember as we start describing Markov decision processes in general. In particular, you could end up with a state transition diagram that looks quite complicated like this. So this is an example of a general Markov decision process. Uh, and so from every node, every green node here corresponds to a state. The red nodes correspond to actions that you can execute from that state. And these actions then have corresponding transition probabilities. For example, the way to read this is at S0, if you execute the action A0, then you end up at state S2 with a probability of 0.5 and you end up back at state S0 with a, with a probability of 0 0.5. And these, these uh, uh, um, yellow arrows correspond to the rewards in this environment. Right? So in particular, if at S2 you execute the action A1, and the action A1 can result in a probability uh, in, uh, in transitioning to S1 with a probability of 0 0.3, in transitioning to S2 with a probability of 0 0.4, and the remainder of the probability, that is 0 0.3, is going to take you back to S0, all right? And if you did that, if you got unlucky and you, you transitioned back to S0, then you get a negative reward of minus one. So the reward is therefore a function of the state that you executed an action from, the action that you executed, and the state that you ended up at. All right, so now let's start describing an MDP more formally. An MDP is typically described by this tuple of capital S, capital A, capital P, and capital R. You might be, uh, these two terms might sound familiar to you because we described them briefly in the introduction. And capital S is simply the set of states, S belonging to capital S. So in the grid world, it would be all the different configurations of the environment, all the different cells that you can occupy. And in, um, and in this case, the set of states would just be these three states, S0, S1, and S2. The set of actions is again, uh, uh, capital A, and it could, in the grid world example, it could be north, south, east, and west. Uh, in this case, you can see that there are basically just two actions, A0 and A1. The third thing that we haven't yet described formally, but which is related to that diagram that we drew, the state transition diagram that we drew, is the transition function, which is often called the state transition function, um, similar to that state transition diagram. And all it says is the probability of transitioning into a new state S prime, given that you're currently at state S and executing the action A, right? So that's, uh, that's what's specified by the transition function. So the probability that executing an action A from state S leads to state S prime. So for example, uh, the transition function corresponding to executing action A1 um, from state S2 and ending up at state S0. So that would be P of S0 given S2 comma A1, that is equal to 0 0.3, right? So you can read that off of this diagram. And this is often also called the dynamics model or just the model of an environment. Okay. And the fourth item in the tuple that completes our description of the MDP is uh, the reward function. And the reward function is, like we said, uh, these yellow arrows are functions of the state that you started at, the action that you executed, and the state that you end up at. So that's R of S, A, S prime. And sometimes in some MDPs, this can be abstracted out as just R of S because in those MDPs, it might be the case that um, your rewards are always just functions of the state you end up at. Additionally, sometimes you're specified a distribution over start states or, uh, or, or terminal states, right? Now, when we apply reinforcement learning, we typically do not know the true functions um, corresponding to state transition function and the reward function. Instead, we only get samples from them. So in other words, we don't know the state transition diagram in advance. Instead, we have to kind of learn through trial and error. Um, and in that process of learning through trial and error, we'll encounter samples from the transition diagram. So you, you will execute an action A1 from state S0, 
and you'll find yourself at S2. And at that point, you can say that, you can only say with certainty that sometimes when you execute action A1, uh, then you end up at S2, starting from S0, right? You can't say with certainty after having only done this once that you will end up at S2 each time. But after you've repeated this process many times, you could potentially have enough information to, uh, to know that, right? So typically you don't actually have access to the underlying function. Uh, you instead only observe samples from it, right? So that's what I mean by observing samples from it. So if you execute an action A0 from S2, then you will sometimes sample the state S0 uh, as a result, and sometimes sample the state S2 as a result. Similarly for the reward, you don't really know for cer with certainty that the reward is, um, is going to be, um, uh, you know, you don't know exactly what function it is. It could be a function of S A S prime. It could be just a function of the state. It could be a function of just the action that you executed and you have to learn all of that. So you only get samples from it. So let's quickly cover why we call this a Markov decision process. This is named after the Russian mathematician, uh, Andre Markov and, uh, and these are called Markov decision processes because they have what's called the Markov property, which is that given the present state, the future states and the past states are probabilistically independent of each other, right? And in other words, everything that you need to know about the past is already included in the present state. You don't have to, to predict what will happen in the future you don't have to look into the past, you only have to look at the present, the description of the present in terms of the state, right? So that state variable in our Markov decision process is key because you can, uh, it's a Markov state, right? It's, it's only a Markov decision process if the state is a Markov state, which means that uh, you should have this property that predicting what the state is going to be at time t plus one, um, given the state at time t and the action at time t, and all the previous states and actions, um, that problem actually reduces because you have the Markov property, it reduces so that you can actually remove all these variables because we said that you only need to know the present state in order to be able to predict what happens in the future. So we don't really need to know anything about the past at all. And so uh, that's the reason that our transition probability is written just as uh, this expression. So st plus one given st comma at, or s prime given s comma a, as we'll sometimes write it. Okay, so now let's apply this abstraction uh, to a few different examples. So if you're trying to train a dog, right, if a dog is trying to learn, if your dog is the learning agent and you're trying to train the dog, then you can think of the actions uh, as the muscle contractions of the dog. If you're trying to teach it a particular trick, uh, its observations are it, it uh, sees you, it, it smells the food that you're holding in your hand, for example, um, and the rewards are the food itself, right? So if it actually gets to uh, eat the food, then, um, then that's a reward. Similarly, if you're trying to train a humanoid robot to perform, uh, let's say a backflip, then your actions could be the motor currents or torques in the various motors throughout the, throughout the robot, your observations would be the camera images from the robot and your um, rewards would be uh, some measure of uh, the task success, like your ability to perform a backflip or maybe you're just trying to train the robot to run fast. And if you're doing inventory management, um, then you could say that your actions are going to be, what should I purchase at this, this instant in time? Uh, your observations will be the current inventory levels and the rewards will be how well is your business doing overall.